Welcome everybody to learn to play Fallout here on alchemyrpg.com. Uh, we are kind of just going through and we are going to be giving you uh, a kind of a lesson on how one to run alchemy, um, but also to run Fallout on alchemy. So the first half of this thing is going to be uh, Vinny here, my, my uh, illustrious partner, uh, and he is going to kind of go over the intricacies of how to run uh, a game here on Alchemy while using Fallout to kind of show the ins and outs of, uh, you know, creating a game, maybe uh, going through the interface and everything like that. Um, and you're going to learn a lot about Alchemy. Then in the second half, you're going to have a little bit of myself and I'm going to be going over how to play Fallout in Alchemy. I'm going to be going over maybe some story, maybe some mechanics and stuff like that. So stick around to the end and you're going to have a lot of information to take in. This is going to be a bit of a longer video. Uh, Fallout is one heck of a system, uh, which means that it has a lot uh, that I can try and share. But do note that everything we share today is not going to be everything in the book. This is a long, long, long book. So whatever we do share with you today, I'm trying to get you to the point where you can play the game and be comfortable jumping in, whilst the intricacies can all be looked up during the game and whatnot. So. Without further ado, we're going to go ahead and jump into it. And Vinny, why don't you go ahead and take it away? So hi, everybody. My name's Vinny. I'm the head of customer success here at Alchemy RPG. For the next two hours or so, um, Dan and I are going to take you through, uh, uh, you know, how to use Alchemy for the first time, right? How to create a game and invite your players, what everything looks like at the table. And then we'll go into Dan's portion where he's going to talk a bit more specifically about uh, the Fallout RPG, how to play it, and how to play it using Alchemy's integration for it. So... First things first, what's Alchemy RPG? Alchemy is a virtual tabletop in the space. You might sort of recognize that type of term from a lot of the other programs used to play your favorite tabletop games online. We just do things a little bit different where uh, we have a very uh, a specific focus around uh, cinematic immersion and theater of the mind gameplay. So when you load into an Alchemy game, you have everything you need to play your game, right? You have your custom dice, you have uh, your character sheets if you're a player, you're empowered to run your games in any way you need to do as a game master, right? If you need to roll out a battle map, there's tactical tools to do things like that. Um, but as you'll see in a second, when I bring us into the game experience, um, you're gonna notice that uh, 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 kind of what, what everything looks like, how we're doing things different, and then I'll sort of walk you through what everything looks like from there. So to get yourself started, um, you can create a free account over at app.alchemyrpg.com. Um, all you need is a, a, create a username, uh, put your email address in, and then create a password, and then you're in and totally ready to go. Uh, and you'll be seeing this screen. What you're seeing right here is the Alchemy homepage. Um, when you go ahead and look, you'll see we have a big banner at the top of the screen, usually highlighting some new releases we have. You'll be able to see any recent games that you joined into uh, right here. And then anyone who's streaming a game live directly in Alchemy or a spectatable game, um, those will be displayed uh, right under here. And I'll go into what that means um, in just a little bit when I talk about uh, a game settings. Just to sort of get things started here, and I'll even go ahead and zoom in just a bit for you all. You can go ahead and create a new game simply by hitting the Create New Game button uh, up here in the upper right. Uh, when you go ahead and click uh, New Game right there, you'll see that you have this little screen where you can go ahead and name your game, uh, select the system for your game, and maybe any content you've purchased off our marketplace. And so I'll go ahead and give this game a title real quick. We'll just call this My New Fallout Game. Uh, we'll go ahead and select the system now. Because I have Fallout on our marketplace, I can go ahead and select Fallout right here. And so what that will do uh, is that it will sort of make my screen here uh, look like um, uh, the sort of theme for the Fallout game, right? You can see I have the little Vault Boy glyph right here. We've got that nice little Fallout blue color uh, now kind of peeking into the modal. And even some of the fonts have changed across the, uh, across the app like this one. Once you make your system, you'll also see that any uh, uh, content you have for that game from our marketplace will actually appear down here for you to select. And so you can go ahead and enable that or not enable any of that if, uh, if you don't want to. For the sake of this presentation, I'm going to go ahead and enable the Alchemy Enhanced Edition of the Fallout Core Rulebook just by clicking right there um, and activating it. And so as you can see, when I make my game, it'll add some scenes uh, directly into uh, the game to sort of get me a little started here. So when you're ready, when everything looks good, you got your title, your system, and any content you want to have enabled, go ahead and select the arrow right here, and that's going to go ahead and make your game in Alchemy. Now, first things first. Anytime you uh, uh, create a game in Alchemy, 
Um, uh, and anytime you really join a game, whether you're a player, a game master, or a spectator, you're going to be brought here to the game's lobby screen. Um, this will give you a second to kind of preview, make sure you, you look good and, and handle a couple different settings before you go into the game and you're hearing everything that's happening and you begin broadcasting your own feed out um, to everybody else at the table. First things first, you can go ahead and check your uh, voice and video uh, input devices here. You know, make sure you look good and you sound good. Um, if your ears are getting blasted out by music as soon as you come in, you can go ahead and click the audio settings in the upper right hand side of your screen and go ahead and adjust those for your feed so that uh, nothing's coming in all too uh, uh, crazy right here. You can also right here in the bottom middle of your screen see any content warnings that are enabled are enabled in the game. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about safety tools a little later, um, but you'll be able to see those right here. If anyone's already logged into the table, you'll be able to see uh, all of their avatar pictures right here. Um, and then finally, if you're not ready to join in yet and you want to go back to the Alchemy homepage, you can click the back button here in the upper left. But without further ado, I think everything's good. Let's just say I sound good and I feel good, I look good. Um, I can go ahead and join a game by hitting the join game button right here. And this will bring me into the main gameplay experience for Alchemy. Um, whenever you make a game, you're always going to be the game master of that game. You can always alter that if you need to for any reason, but just understand that you're going to start by looking at the game master's experience. Before I get uh, into anything else with regards to the UI, um, I have to uh, go ahead and if I want, maybe invite some other players to the table. And so you can do that in two ways. When you first make your game, you'll get this little summon your party modal where you can go ahead and copy an invite link just by clicking the chain icon right there. And what you can do is if your party is in a, a, like a group chat or something like that, you can distribute this link to them. And then when they go ahead and click on it, if they're logged into Alchemy, their account's automatically going to go ahead and join into this game uh, when they go ahead and do that. If you don't want to dis dis uh, distribute an open link um, to your game, you can go ahead and add players manually by clicking the add players button right here, which will bring you to this screen where you can go ahead and manage who's in the game. Um, when you get to this screen, you can always copy the invite link again, um, or you can go ahead and add players by their username here in Alchemy. And so let's say I want to add Dan's accounts real quick um, as part of this game. Maybe he's a player. Um, I can go ahead and type his Alchemy username in here, which is both Nat1 Productions for one account, or Nat1 Fun for one account, and Nat1 uh, Productions for his other account. Once I've gone ahead and typed them in right there, um, Dan has effectively been added to this game and he can go ahead and view this game from his games li library and even join in here. Um, if I wanted to as well, if, if I'm a game master of a game, I can go ahead and promote any players to game master as well, right? So if I have a West Marches style campaign where different people are maybe running the game week to week, you as a game master can always empower other players to be the game master at that table as well or you can even demote game masters down to players or even just remove them from the game altogether. But once you got everybody in your game, you can always save that change by clicking the little white check mark down here. And that will just bring you out of that screen into the core uh, uh, sort of visual that you're seeing here. And what you're seeing uh, is sort of the main gameplay experience for Alchemy. Now, I'm gonna walk you through about everything on this screen. Um, just understand that this is the game master's view uh, specifically, right? So a lot of their tools, um, in contrast to players, have to do with maintaining and running the game. Um, players view, it looks a lot similar, but there are some differences. I'll highlight a couple of those at a pretty high level, but when Dan goes into his part, he's actually going to be walking through a lot of what he talks about from the player's perspective. And so you'll be able to see uh, kind of what that looks like in contrast firsthand um, when he gets a little more into what he's going to talk about later. So, um, just to get started here, on the right side of your screen, um, you're going to have uh, two panels to start off with, and these take up the entire right-hand side of the screen for Game Masters. First things first, you have the journal. Um, the journal is kind of like your message board, right? So if I go to the input field down here, I can go ahead and type right there and say hi to everybody in the game. That's going to be broadcasted to everyone else's journal, um, and they can go ahead and type back and forth uh, to everybody there, um, you know, and... Uh, 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 you know, start a, a chat message right there for, for any any reason you'd want to communicate. In addition to that, a lot of events that come up in the game will pop up there, right? So I'll get to the dice roller in a second. But if I go ahead and roll dice, you're actually going to see that those dice rolls pop up in the journal as well. And so that's where a lot of that stuff ends up. 
If you use actions like a roll table or, or maybe you play a quick sound um, as part of a sound action, all of those events pop up in the journal and it's a real great way to sort of track the events that are kind of happening in the game. Finally, um, as a game master, you have the ability to delete any messages, players can delete their own messages, and they can do that simply by just right clicking the message that they had sent, clicking the delete button, and then that'll remove itself from the journal for everybody entirely. From the journal panel, if you go ahead and click the notes icon, or the notes text right up here I should say, um, you'll be brought to the notes panel. Notes panel is very similar, it's got an input field that you can type into, but the best way I like to describe this is that it's kind of like your sticky notes, right? So maybe you're you're running a game as a game master and your players uh, maybe go to a town you're not expecting them to go to and they go into a shop and you as a game master weren't prepared for this. You need to, you know, maybe figure out uh, the shopkeeper's name and a core characteristic about them. Um, you can go ahead and maybe sequester those notes out to the side over here um, just to get them out of your head and maybe incorporate them into your, your broader world notes, you know, a little later after the session. So my player zigzag, maybe I come up with a shopkeeper named Ernie, um, and he's got gray hair. I can type a quick note right there, click on the feather, and then that note's going to be published right here in the notes panel. If you click on a note, you can edit it, you can also remove it, and then notes also persist between games, right? So if you leave a game and come back to it later, your notes are going to stay. The other big, big thing about notes is that nobody else can see them. So every player and game master in the game has their own notes panel, and so nobody can see that information. So if you're kind of scheming and, and maybe just dropping a couple secrets over there just to kind of remind yourself of something during the gameplay, um, you can go ahead and rest assured that nobody else is going to see that information. And that's the notes panel uh, in a bit of a nutshell. Now players um, will have the journal and the notes here. They'll have a couple more panels in the bottom left hand side. Uh, just understand that those panels uh, are generally to help them uh, play the game, right? They'll be able to see their equipment. They'll be able to see in, uh, their skills and roll any tests as part of the game. Um, and so a lot of that will be sort of in the bottom left hand region. But for game masters, because they're not playing a character, um, they don't have that. The entire left hand side of their screen is just taken up by the journal and the notes panel. Moving on over to the center bottom of the screen here, we have three really important buttons. We have our gear icon or our options menu. Uh, we have our dice roller, which is this big white button right there. And then we have uh, a button to help mute and unmute any of our audio devices that are being broadcasted into the game. And so first things first, if I click on the options menu right here, we have a bunch of things that come up and I'll sort of go through these bottom to top. First things first, if you join into a game, you need a way to be able to leave it. Hitting the quick game button right here just takes you back to the Alchemy homepage and moves you out of the game um, so you can go ahead and join it again, you know, at a different time. Game Masters are going to have this edit game button right here and for players it's going to say gameplay settings instead. They're both the same exact thing, the only big difference is that Game Masters can edit the game settings while players can only view those settings. So when you click in here, you're going to have a bunch of tabs and we'll kind of walk through uh, a bit of what everything is right here. So first, we're going to start in the game tab right here. We already had named our game when we made the game, but if you wanted to make it something else and, and rename it, um, you can always go ahead and edit the name of the game right here. You can also give the game a description, right? So if you're broadcasting your game externally uh, on the homepage, you might have noticed that some of those games had a little extra text under the name of the game. That's actually everything contained within the description field. So. If you want to give a quick summary maybe of the setting or the story or what's kind of going on, um, you can go ahead and type that right here. And anyone else who's viewing uh, the game on the homepage uh, will be able to see that description. Moving on through, um, you can go ahead and upload artwork for the game right here. Um, this would normally be blank and you can go ahead and upload any picture that you want and that will display as the thumbnail when you're viewing this game either on the home screen or your game's library in Alchemy. Um, the reason we actually have the sort of key art for the Fallout RPG here is because we had made this game using the Fallout Core rulebook, and so that actually uploaded that artwork there by default um, when, when we had made this game. But you can make it whatever you would like. You can choose any themes from any content that's currently connected to your game. Themes, very broadly speaking, um, don't really change much about the gameplay in Alchemy, but uh, they might change the UI uh, experience just a little bit to maybe make you feel like you're, you're playing that game specifically. 
And so what I mean by that is that if you look around the screen here, you're going to notice we have this little fallout blue color in a lot of areas of the, the interface. We even got our little vault boy here on the, on the dice roller. And so what happens is when you change a theme, uh, those things will generally change. So if we go back to our core alchemy theme, you'll see everything changes to our alchemy gold color. It goes back to our, our sort of uh, generic font for uh, the company. Um, and we have our more generic D20 uh, glyph on the dice roller. But when we go back to the Fallout theme, which was also enabled because we had enabled the core rulebook, um, you'll see everything sort of changes to the Fallout font, color, and glyph. From here, we have a bunch of toggle settings, and most of them are pretty self-explanatory, but to go through them really quick, um, when you go ahead and allow watchers, this allows people to spectate your game, right? So this is the setting that will move your game onto the Acne homepage for anyone to join as a spectator um, when any player or game master is currently logged in. So if you want other people in your game, maybe you want to, you know, start a little amateur actual play, um, you can go ahead and use that button to, uh, uh, you know, maybe start that process. Uh, if you go ahead and enable private GM roles, um, your roles and, and all the dice that you sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, use in our dice roller will be fully hidden from the players in the game. So to kind of show that off real quick, if I enable that and then I roll some dice, you're going to see that my chat uh, looks, uh, has this kind of like gold color around it, the little chat bubble, as opposed to the first roll I had. This means that that dice roll wasn't broadcasted to the players in the game, right? So if I'm a game master, maybe I like to fudge a roll every now and again for the sake of the story. Um, this gives me kind of a leeway to do something like that. Popping back in here, we have Universe Search here. Uh, Universe Search is this little hourglass icon right there. I'll get to this a little bit more uh, towards the end of, of what I'm talking about, but just understand that Universe Search allows you to search through any content that's connected to your game. And what that toggle does is makes is uh, either uh, enable or disable players from being able to use Universe Search because you as a game master can always use it and you can choose if you want players to be able to use it or not. So they're not poking around any hidden notes that are enabled in the game or anything like that. Uh, this setting right here, save journal messages, will make it so that your journal messages that pop up in the journal tab persist across games, right? So if it's enabled, when you leave a game and join again, you'll see all the old messages that were uh, a part of the game. And when you disable it, anytime anyone joins into the game, the journal is going to be fully cleared out and it's just going to provide maybe a cleaner experience, but you don't have the old information to reference. And then finally, we have uh, settings for both voice and video chat. We have voice and video here in Alchemy, so if you want to go ahead and use those tools, you're free to do so. These toggles just decide um, whether those uh, features are currently enabled or disabled for your game. Moving on from there, we're going to go from the game tab over to the players tab right here. And this is actually the tab I had already showed you when I invited uh, dance accounts to the game a little bit earlier. So if you want to get back and maybe invite a new player to the game after you had already made it, um, this is where you'd go to take care of that. And so, uh, you know, you can always reaccess uh, adding and dropping players right here in the players set, uh, section of the settings. The content tab is where you can go to enable uh, a specific uh, content for your game. Uh, we don't go too far into uh, this part of our core feature set as part of these learn to play presentations, but just understand that Universes is a whole feature set in Alchemy that's around creating and managing both content you buy off our marketplace as well as any homebrew content you make. Um, you can create NPCs, you can create articles for any sort of like textual information, um, you can create items, handouts, and I'll go into what these things are um, in a little bit. Um, but just understand that this is where you'd go to basically enable or disable any uh, books and other resources for your game. And so scrolling through the content here, um, I believe we've already got the Fallout uh, content enabled because I'd enabled the core rulebook um, when I had uh, created this game. But if I wanted to, Dan and I actually have our own little custom Fallout universe for start playing games. And so if we really wanted to, we can go ahead and en enable that. And what that will do is that anywhere I can reference the core rulebooks content in Fallout, I can also reference any of our homebrew content that we have brought into this game uh, through our own universe. And so when I go ahead and click save, all that's referenceable. And I'll get into what that looks like a little later, but just understand that's where you go to manage what's in the game. 
Moving over to the safety tab, um, we're pretty big on safety tools here in the platform. We have three of them currently implemented um, for everybody in the game, and two of them are predominantly managed on this page right here. The first safety tool is lines and veils. Lines and veils are a really good way for everybody to individually indicate what types of content and subject matter they're maybe okay with having in the game, uh, but you know, maybe skirt around some of the finer details and what type, what type of content really probably just shouldn't be broached at all. And, and it's just not fun to kind of play out in an RPG scenario for one reason or another. So your veils are the things that can maybe be touched upon but not gone into too deep. And your lines are things that absolutely just shouldn't come up in gameplay. What's really nice about lines and veils here is that everybody individually on their alchemy account can set their own personal lines and veils. When they do, when everybody joins into the game, right here on the safety tab, everybody will be able to view all of the lines and all of the veils of everybody in the game anonymously. Because it shouldn't matter who has what line and who has what veil, it just matters that that's what someone's comfortable with. And everyone can always reference this page to understand what types of content maybe should or shouldn't come up in gameplay. And so it's a good way to just sort of understand where things should and shouldn't go. Moving on here, our second safety tool is a uh, content warning. So you can always flag your game as mature content, but you can also add specific uh, 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 types of subject matter into the game just to give people a warning that, hey, these things can come up uh, during the game. You know, if you don't want to be exposed to it, it might not be the game for you. And you can always choose to navigate away before exposing yourself to that content. So in practice, what this looks like is uh, maybe I am sending everybody on a Fallout adventure to fight a mutant spider in a cave somewhere. Uh, because of that, spiders can come up in the game, and that's fine, but someone who's maybe arachnophobic uh, would have a, a tough time with that. Um, if I wanted to as well, I can also type in custom content warnings. So speaking of that cave, right, maybe it's a very small, tight place, and there you want to just kind of speak to, uh, you know, the fact that uh, claustrophobia could come up as a part of that narrative. And so you can always uh, go ahead and type in uh, tight spaces as a custom content warning for your game and when you click enter it's actually going to add itself uh, just like anything else in the, uh, in the game oh, that little uh, typo right there but that's fine when I click save right here uh, nothing really changes on the gameplay screen but for any player game master or spectator who joins into the game you're actually going to see uh, those content warnings come up right here uh, on the game lobby screen before you actually hear and see anything that's kind of happening in the gameplay. And so that gives you a pretty good idea of, um, uh, you know, whether the narrative is right for you and whether you should join in or, or maybe back out if this isn't the game you, you really feel comfortable spectating. And so in a nutshell, that's content warnings. And that's everything on the safety tab. Moving over to streaming right here, uh, this tab's still a bit empty, but just understand that we have a whole uh, feature set around uh, uh, broadcasting your games online that's coming to Alchemy really soon. And this streaming tab is where a lot of those settings are going to live. So they're just not here yet, but that's where they're going to be. And so that pretty much takes us all the way through uh, the edit game or game settings or, uh, you know, uh, larger settings menu um, for, uh, you know, the, the particular table that you're at. Moving on up a little bit we've got gameplay settings. And when you click this, this will actually take you into your uh, modal that helps you uh, handle things specifically related to your Alchemy account. You can also access everything here by selecting your profile picture on the homepage, which is in the bottom left-hand side of the screen. Um, and just to kind of rip through these real quick, the gameplay tab here has a bunch of options that you can either choose to enable or disable, maybe to improve the quality of your gameplay or the performance of Alchemy on your computer, right? Some people have better computers than other people and you know all the motion effects and music and everything might cause a couple computers to sputter every now and again. Those folks can come in here and change some of these settings up uh, to maybe make Alchemy a bit easier to run on their device. In addition, you can always go ahead and navigate to the purchases tab to see what content you've bought on Alchemy. You can navigate to the safety tab to specifically indicate your own personal lines and veils, which will come up in the game like I had mentioned before. And then finally, if you click on profile right here, you'll be able to, to mess with uh, your username, your email, um, and some of the other more general settings related to your account and your subscription and things of that nature. And you can always update your profile picture up here. Moving from gameplay settings, we have the safety tools. 
All this does is when you click it, it brings you back to the safety tools uh, uh, section of the game settings that we had already went over. So just a bit of a shortcut to go back and reference that information. We finally have the X card, which is our third safety tool. So if lines and veils and content warnings are more preventative in nature of just making sure that people know what types of content they shouldn't go into before they get to it, X card is a great way to deal with things as they come up. Right, so maybe the narrative kind of takes a turn uh, in a way where someone's not comfortable with. If they can click the X card right there, they'll actually send an X card to everybody in the game anonymously. And what that looks like if Dan does it right here is that everybody will get a, uh, a sort of notification on your screen that just says, hold up, not everybody's comfortable with the current subject matter. And then everybody has to click OK to go through that. Usually the, tro the problematic subject is pretty obvious. Um, and everybody in the game can go ahead and, uh, you know, spin the narrative away from whatever's coming up so that everyone feels comfy and cozy playing these games, because that's why we're doing these things in the first place. So, that's the X card, generally speaking. Um, the other thing about the X card I should mention is that it's fully anonymous. So if you click the X card, nobody knows who actually selected it, because that really shouldn't matter at the end of the day. Um, you should just be able to say, hey, yeah, I feel comfortable, um, or I don't, and indicate to everybody you know, when, when to navigate away from certain things. We'll have some more streamer mode settings right here in the future. Um, it's just not quite available yet because we're still building those out. And finally, the last two buttons here are really important. So Zen mode is a really cool feature that we had uh, launched about two months ago. And what this is, is, uh, you know, if maybe the game master is spotlighting with another player and you're not really involved in it, so you don't need your character sheet, or maybe you're running a game in person and on your TV, you want to use the visuals and the audio uh, within Alchemy, uh, but maybe don't need the UI here. What Zenmo will do is when you select it, it just kicks the UI out. So you can enjoy the music, you can enjoy the visuals, all of that stuff, um, you know, within the system, uh, but without the UI in the way. It just kind of, you know, moves it to the side. And when you're ready to bring it back, you just go back in here, you select Zenmo again, and it brings it all back together. And then finally, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the help button right here. Now this button's also accessible on the home page. It's also on the bottom left hand side, uh, right above your profile picture. But when you select it, you get two core tabs. The first one's our help tab. This is our knowledge base. So what Dan and I are going into today is a pretty broad overview of Alchemy. It's enough to get your feet wet and get comfortable with it, but it's definitely not everything it can do. And so you can go in, you can select any category, you can go into any specific articles and view a lot of information uh, that basically serves as the manual of the platform. Past our knowledge base, we also have the feedback tab right here. Uh, what you can do is you can type anything into this form. Maybe you have a bug you want to report to us. Um, maybe you have a way that you think a feature can work a little bit better uh, for you. Um, or maybe you just have like a game system you'd love to see as bespoke integration for if it's not in here already. You can go ahead and type any of those things in here and then uh, go ahead and send it to us using the button down here. That goes to our support email address. 19 times out of 20, it's going to be me answering that. And so what you can go ahead and do there is just, uh, uh, you know, sending any feedback you want our way. We read all of it. We respond to all of it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's really good for us to kind of know what you want to see come to Alchemy in the future and how things can work better for you and your gaming groups individually. So feel free to use the feedback form for anything you can think of at all. And that brings us through everything in the options menu. It's a lot, um, but it's a lot of really good settings and this is mostly where a lot of that stuff is contained. Moving on, uh, we have the floating action button here. That's what we call it. Uh, this is the save button when you're in a lot of the menus in the game, but when you're not in anything, it serves as your dice roller. So you can go ahead and click on it and you'll be presented with all the options you need to roll dice in your specific game. So for the Fallout RPG, we have very specific dice here for a basic roll, your action point dice, your damage dice, and your hit location. Um, for other games uh, like 5e, you get your standard set of polyhedrals. Um, and what you can go ahead and do is select any dice you wanna roll. You can queue up multiple rolls if you want to as well. And when you go ahead and send them through by clicking the button again, it'll actually take all those rolls um, and uh, put them into the journal so that you can go ahead and take the narrative wherever it needs to go based on the results, whatever check, save, or, or result that comes up. From there, we've also got our uh, mute and unmute button. Simply enough, when you click it, you'll either mute or unmute yourself. Um, we don't have any push to talk on the platform today, but this is a pretty close way to get there. 
And then when you're in the native app, um, as opposed to a web browser, uh, using Alchemy in a web browser, you'll have this little carrot icon right here at the bottom. When you click on it, you'll be able to select any of the input devices uh, on your computer. Um, but when you're in a browser, that carrot icon won't actually be there. Instead, you'll just take over, uh, uh, or Alchemy will use whatever the default uh, input device is for audio um, that's selected in your browser settings. And so that generally covers everything in the bottom of your screen. We've got a couple panels over here on the bottom right hand side of your screen. Um, these panels for game masters, uh, generally speaking, are to help them run the game um, and do a couple different things, which I'll go into in just a second here. For players, these panels are going to look a little different. It's going to help them play their character and play the game. And, and Dan will show you those a little bit more when he gets to his portion of things. Um, but just understand that's kind of a key differentiator between the two views. So we're going to start right here with the scenes tab. Now scenes in Alchemy are kind of the bread and butter of the immersive experience that Alchemy really excels at delivering. So uh, within a scene, those can manage all the audio that you hear, it can manage any of the visuals that you have going on, um, and it's really just to kind of help take the narrative to a particular location and give that location a face and, and uh, a, a concept that people can kind of absorb into their heads. We have a couple scenes preloaded here from the Alchemy Core rulebook, and when I go ahead and select one, I can either play that scene for everybody, so if I click play, it fades the old scene out, and it fades the new one in, and then everybody can see this. If I wanted to, maybe I need to kind of make sure a scene looks good before I broadcast it to my players. I can click on a scene and I can preview the scene as well. And so what this will do is that it'll play the scene for me, all the visual, visuals, all the audio, things like that. The big, big difference is that um, my players can't see this because I'm previewing it. They can, they're still being played the old scene. And if I go ahead and click the X button on the previewing scene notification, it'll boot me back to whatever's being broadcasted live. I can also click on the uh, notes right here in the scene, which I'll get to in just a second. And then I can also edit the scene or remove it from my view altogether. Now, a big important thing too, is that a lot of things in the platform, you can go ahead and click on and you'll see the options pop up in the middle, but in pretty much everywhere where those happen, you can also just right click um, and you'll get all those same options, right? So if you want, don't want to left click and drag your cursor across the screen, you don't have to do that. We have right click functionality in the platform as well. So just to kind of explain the anatomy of a scene very quickly, if I go ahead and edit the scene, you'll see that every scene has a name and a location. From there, you can upload whatever sort of visual you want for the scene. You can also upload a motion effect to the scene. So as you can see here, we have this sort of reddish hue with the Nuka-Cola sign and the moving uh, 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 curtain in the window. Uh, and that's kind of the motion overlay that's happening right now, but I can go ahead and remove that. And you can see right here that that curtain's gone, uh, the hue's gone. Um, this is a really great way to incorporate things like snow, rain, fire, um, any of these more dynamic uh, aspects of the visual that you want to incorporate into any picture that you want. Moving from there, you can go ahead and incorporate any of the music tracks that you want into your game to really set the vibe and set the tone of the narrative. You can add any ambient sounds, right? So rainfall, um, birds chirping in the distance, um, maybe you just have like cave noises if you're in a cave. You can go ahead and upload that as a separate ambient track. And then finally, uh, you can also upload any music and ambience specifically for when you enter an encounter, right? When you might be in a battle or a fight or something like that. And I'll show you how to trigger that a little bit later. Moving from the general scenes tab, you also have the tactical tab. If you have a battle map for your game, you can go ahead and upload it right here into this particular scene. And when you move into tactical mode, You'll be able to see that battle map. You can bring tokens out and do everything you need to do right there. But this is where you go ahead and add that map, as well as designate whether you want a square sphere grid, whether you want a hex grid, and how big you want that grid to be. And then finally, um, you have the notes tab for a scene. We don't have any notes in here. And so what I'll do real quick is when you scroll to the bottom of the scenes tab, you can actually add a scene um, directly into your game. And you can either create a new one from scratch or enable one from any content in the game. So I have all the scenes in here from the core rulebook, but let's say I want to add a scene from the uh, starter set, which I need to find right now. So we have the starter set. Let's say I want to add into Vault 95, which is part of the adventure in that uh, particular uh, supplement. If I go ahead and go here and play it or even edit it and go to the notes tab, you'll see we have a ton of information here uh, specifically around the adventure. Uh, and so I can reference all that right here 
it takes in markdown formatting so while this isn't the the general place you can view it uh, a great thing you can do is either click notes right here and you'll be able to see all the notes with all the headers and the markdown rendering as expected um, and you can edit it if you need to by opening it up to edit with that icon up there or you can navigate to the story tab while the scene is being played and you'll be seeing all the same information so it's a really great way to reference a ton of information uh, within the story itself so you're not really bouncing around um, uh, uh, too many different places for notes, right? If you have shops that have certain things in certain locations, you can hold that kind of information in the stories tab so that it's kind of in front of you when you need it, when their players are there, um, but you don't need to actually have it with you when you are maybe outside of the city and, and on an adventure. So that's kind of the stories tab and scene notes and how they all kind of work together. Moving from the story tab, we have tools. And tools are kind of bro broken down to two main uh, features in Alchemy. We have actions and we have trackers. Actions are kind of like your small macros in the platform. Uh, they can help you roll dice, maybe roll an attack in some systems, play a quick one-time sound effect, uh, find a result on a roll table. Um, you know, do, do a lot of things like that a bit more automated um, so that you can kind of cut right back into the gameplay experience you know, when you're done with that. And so, as an example, I'm going to go ahead and add an action into the game. We have a bunch of roll tables from the core rulebook. Um, we'll do the guns and bullets issues uh, specifically. We can see that this is a roll table action that was you know, brought into the game. And if I go ahead and click it, I can go ahead and use it. And I have the uh, you know particular result here. And once I see that result off this roll table, I can take the narrative and, you know, appropriately, you know, uh, resolve whatever the reason was I had to make that roll. You can also make your own actions too, right? So you're just seeing a lot of the content that's in the core rulebook, which is content enabled in the game. Um, but if you want to, nothing's stopping you from adding an action um, and then making your own one up here specifically for your game. Trackers um, are really cool. So these allow you to track finite resources in the game, um, either uh, individually or as a party. And so as a great example here, uh, one of the mechanics in Fallout for the entire group is your action points. And Dan will speak a little bit more about as, as far as what that's for. But if you go ahead, you can add a tracker and you can make one. And players and game masters can do this. I can go ahead and give it a name. So we'll call this action points. And I didn't give it a typo that time. Uh, I can go ahead and select what type of tracker it is, right? So do I want like a progress bar or do I want just pips you can select? I'm going to call this one a pip tracker. And then uh, we're going to make this uh, pip tracker a maximum value of six. And we'll give it a current value of six as well. And so I'll go ahead and save that tracker by clicking the check mark down here. And you'll see right here that we have a little pip tracker, uh, which can be uh, uh, displayed based on the accent color of the game's theme. Uh, and when you click down or click up, you'll see that that resource um, goes up or down, you know, based on whatever uh, sort of happens in the game. What's also really cool and is a super new feature we recently launched is if I right click a tracker as a game master, I can actually share this out with other people. And so when you go and share a tracker, uh, you'll be able to uh, share this tracker uh, individually with players or just with the party overall. And since action points are a party wide resource, I can share it with everybody. And when I click OK, you'll see that the action point tracker is shared. And if Dan makes a change to that tracker on his side, you'll actually see the pips start disappearing or reappearing based on that. So it's kind of a shared resource for everybody altogether. So it's a really cool thing. Players can have all the individual trackers they need. Game masters can do that as well, but they can also share trackers out for anything shared across the table. And so that's generally everything with actions, trackers, and tools for the game master in general. The final tab down here in the bottom right is handouts. Handouts are sort of those things, um, those kind of like tangible things you want to give people if you're playing in person, right? So if you're going to um, a wedding and you have a royal invitation and you want to give the players that invitation, have them read it out and see the script and everything like that and have a more tangible experience with that interaction, you might do something physical while you're in person, but you might use a handout in Alchemy um, when you're playing virtually. So as a great example here, if I go ahead and add, an, add a handout, um, I've got the Guns and Bullets uh, magazine from the Fallout RPG's starter set. And so when I click it, I'll add it to my game. And if I select it and view it, you'll see that we just have this neat little magazine uh, cover uh, specifically for uh, the Guns and Bullets magazine. 
you can go ahead and edit or create any handout you want. The handouts are just a visual. Um, you can choose to have it open in full screen or in just a small little modal like this. And then you can even give it some supplementary content, right? So if I give someone that's like this very, you know, descriptive elvish font um, that might be a little hard to read, I can give it some supplementary text right there. And when I save that and click uh, into view it again, we still have our visual, but you'll also have some supplementary text right there for people. Um, just to show you these sort of open and full screen as well. What's really cool about that is when you go ahead and view it, all the supplementary text will appear on the right hand side of your screen, but you can actually kind of move uh, the, the visual around. You can zoom into it, zoom out of it. Uh, it just gives you a way to kind of handle the, the uh, handout itself, which is pretty neat. And then of course, the most important part about handouts is being able to hand them out. And so just like trackers, you can go ahead and share a handout with either one or many players. When you click OK, you'll see the thumbnails of the profile pictures of the players that have access to that handout. And that handout from that point forward appears in the player's handouts tab, which is really great. Um, and then if you need to for any reason, you can also unshare uh, a handout. They shouldn't have access to it anymore for one reason or another. But that kind of takes you through most of the tabs in the bottom uh, right hand side of your screen. And so we're coming around the horn here. Um, we're going up to the top left now, and these ones will be relatively quick. Um, we have the party tab and we have the NPC tab. The party tab is where you can kind of manage everything about the actual people in the game, right? The game masters and the players, the people with alchemy accounts. And so you can go ahead and click on anyone and see a wealth of information. Um, as a, a great example here, we have Dan the Man, which is the character that Dan had made for this particular game. And as a game master, there's a lot I can do here. I can go ahead and select him and then view the character. And what that will let me do is basically peek at Dan's character sheet, right? So I can see all of his information, all of his statistics, if he has anything. Um, if I need to for any reason, I can go ahead and open his character sheet to edit it, right? So if I think uh, he should be level one because he left that off his character sheet, I can put that in and click okay. And that way, when Dan and I go to view the sheet in the future, we'll see he's level one. And so that change kind of sticks for everybody. From there as well, I can go ahead and edit any of Dan's individual trackers. Um, if I want, I can bring his token out for a tactical encounter and I'll show you a little bit more about that in just a second. I can also whisper Dan on the side, right? So if I want to scheme something with Dan, you know, away from all the other players, um, I can go ahead and select whisper. We'll see a little syntax uh, pop up in the journal here that basically tells Alchemy Ham, I just want this message going to one person. And I can go ahead and type secrets over to him. And when I click OK, we'll see that the chat bubble uh, is gold, indicating that that's a private thing. Um, we'll see that it went to Dan the man, and then Dan can go ahead and respond to me just like that uh, uh, within Alchemy. So it's a quick way to have those little side table conversations um, out in the open. Finally, uh, the last two things you can do here for players when you're a game master is you can play as them, right? So if you kind of want to sit in the seat as Dan just to kind of see his view and what everything looks like, you can go ahead and play and it'll bring up his player bar where you can manage his trackers and his character sheet. Um, it'll bring up a couple of his uh, player tabs right here. I can even go ahead and type in as, uh, uh, you know, as Dan directly. Uh, and so... Uh, I can also get out of it if I click uh, X right there. So it brings me back to the Game Master screen. And then finally, um, we have statuses right here. Statuses are really great just to kind of indicate something quick to everybody in the party panel, right? So if I click on my own status right here and I need to go to the bathroom, right? I can go ahead and select bio right there, click save. And that changes my Alchemy username under my title to whatever I set my status as. And so it's a really good way to maybe indicate something quick for everybody. Maybe you're on the phone uh, or, or away for a second. And then what the, the last thing you can also do is when you click on yourself in here, you can actually set yourself to away so that that will actually change your little status indicator to yellow. And when you're back, um, you can go ahead and select here, which will change it back to green. It's a really good way. So if you take like a mid session break for five minutes, people are grabbing food, going to the bathroom, making a drink, whatever it is, um, you can go ahead and, uh, you know, set yourselves uh, away um, and, you know, passively let everybody know when you're, you're back and ready to play. While you're on the party tab as well, you have two buttons down here. If you click the add player button, you'll just be brought back to the player section of the game settings where you can go ahead and make any modifications there. 
And then finally, on an individual basis, you can also adjust the volume on a per player basis for anyone online. So if someone's coming in a little bit loud compared to everybody else, you have the ability to turn them down. Oh, look at Dan. He actually put his real name and his pronouns in there too, which is a nice real call out for statuses too. Um, so that's everything in the party panel. Moving to the NPCs panel, it's a little different, but it's actually very similar. Uh, at the bottom down here, instead of adding players, I can add NPCs to the game. And just like anything else, I can make uh, my own NPC um, or bring one into the game uh, if I really wanted to. Um, you can go ahead and move and I'll actually just create a, a quick one right here. We have our little new NPC right there. Um, by default, when you add an NPC into the game, that NPC is going to be hidden from view. Um, as a game master, I can either select that NPC and show it, or I can drag it up uh, out of hidden and into the shown section of the NPCs panel. And what that will do is, once the NPC is shown, the players will be able to see that NPC in their NPCs panel. But when that NPC is hidden for any reason, they don't actually know that NPC exists quite yet. So you can go ahead and reveal them, maybe when they walk through the door in the narrative, for instance. Uh, past that, when you select an NPC, um, you'll see a lot of the similar uh, options you have that I've pointed out already, right? So you can view the NPC statistics and make edits to them. You can bring their token out in tactical mode. You can play as them, manage their trackers. Um, the last kind of three here are different. Of course, self-explanatory, you can remove the NPC from a scene by clicking the remove button. You can send the NPC to a journal or to the journal, um, which will uh, basically, you know, bring it up here as an event. You'll see their artwork. You can click into it, see all their information. Um, or my favorite part of this is that you can also share the NPC. And so when you share an NPC, you can share with one or any players. And when you do that, it does two things. One, by default, when players go to view an NPC, they'll just see their profile picture and whatever public description that NPC has. But when you share the NPC with them, they'll be able to see all of their in-game statistics um, and, and all of those little secrets and uh, numbers and things like that, right? So maybe you have a player that has a, um, like a bestial companion or like a dog or something like that. You can actually share that NPC with them so that they can manage that dog um, during the gameplay. And then the other thing that allows you to do is when you share an NPC with a player, players can actually move that NPC's token when you're on a battle map. Um, generally speaking, game masters can move any token, but players can only move their own token or the tokens of any NPCs that are shared with them. And so that's what sharing NPCs generally do. We also have this turn order toggle up here. Depends on the game. Maybe it's an encounter toggle. Maybe it's an initiative toggle. Um, all that toggle does is uh, bring you into a sort of turn order where you can sort of establish an order for people to, you know, uh, move, fight, whatever it might be for your game. When you're in turn order, you can go ahead and progress to the next turn or the previous turn using the buttons down here. And let's say that, uh, you know, I need to reorder people in the turn order for one reason or another. You can actually drag and drop uh, people to sort of establish the order as the game master. Finally, this toggle is also what controls encounter music and encounter ambience. So as soon as that toggle is hit, the music uh, and ambience will change in the scene. Uh, if encounter music and encounter ambience is uploaded um, so that that way, you know, the mood shifts and everything uh, kind of goes into a fight from there. From here, I just got to explain these last four buttons here. Um, I'll actually navigate back to the scene as I do this. Uh, the first button here is this little map button. We call this tactical mode. This is when you want to roll out a battle map in your game. And so when you click on it, you'll see that the scene kind of fades to the back and you have this little tactical grid that comes up. Now, if you have a battle map uploaded in your scene, that map will actually appear here. But if you don't, you'll just get our default tactical grid. Now, sort of like I was saying before, I can go ahead as a game master and click on the token option for any player or NPC to actually bring a token out onto this grid. But I can go ahead and bring Dan's token out. And I can bring this little NPC's token out. Um, and you can go ahead and move them around as a game master if you need to for any reason. Uh, or you can even, um, uh, as Dan can do on his side, he can move his own token as well. We have a couple other things here in tactical mode that you can use as well. Um, so by default, you can go ahead and hold left click to move the map around or move a token around if you're on top of the token. If you want, if you're not moving anything but you hold left click, You'll actually do this little sonar ping effect um, that also has a little sound effect that goes with it. 
And what that does for everybody is it tells them kind of where you're pointing at on the screen. So if a player goes, hey, I don't want to attack that monster over there, nobody's looking around the table and being like, okay, great. What monster are you talking about? You can just literally ping on top of the token um, and indicate that that's the um, uh, monster that you want to uh, uh, attack for one reason or another. Another cool thing I forgot is when you have a token selected, you can also rotate it, right? So if you have a game that relies on token facing, you can change the face of the token in what direction it's looking. Um, past that, we also uh, have a measure tool, so you can measure how many squares um, are kind of between two points on the battle map. And then we also have fog of war tools, right? So you can add fog or erase fog um, from a battle map, very similar to um, kind of like a paint style fog of war. Or you can also cover and reveal everything when you have a battle map as well. So that's generally uh, what tactical mode looks like today. So if you need to roll out a battle map, that's how you do something like that. We then have our audio settings. For players, this could be very basic. It's just one or two sliders that uh, uh, you know bring up how uh, loud or how soft uh, the volume from Alchemy is. For Game Masters, it's a bit more involved. Um, you have sliders for everything uploaded to the scenes. So that could be music, sounds, and ambient effects. And what you can do is you can go ahead and adjust the volumes for yourself. Right, so as they bring the music up just like that, you should start hearing the music come through uh, uh, on uh, Fallout. And so whatever the sort of mix is here, right, if I bring the sounds way down or way up and I bring the music down, that sort of, uh, those levels and the combination of all those sounds is what will be broadcasted to players, right? So if you want to rip the ambience up and rip the music down for any reason, you can do that. Players just adjust how loud or how soft it is. Finally, um, one really cool thing is that we have this little triangle slider up here. This is our Alchemy Enhanced slider, and this comes with any scene that has Alchemy Enhanced music in it. On our marketplace, we have a ton of core rulebooks available for a lot of your favorite RPGs, and a lot of those core rulebooks have an Alchemy Enhanced option associated with them. What that means is that we worked hand in hand with a publisher to specifically make Alchemy exclusive assets for their game to really help those games shine uh, here on this platform. So every Alchemy Enhanced title comes with a couple things. It comes with an animated title screen, which is actually what you've been looking at this entire time I've been talking about, right? You have the little vault dweller and the dog kind of bobbing up and down. Um, it comes with 10 uh, motion overlays, right? So like that little uh, red um, uh, sort of glow that I had removed earlier, that's one of the Fallout exclusive motion overlays. Um, it also comes with 10 ambient soundscapes um, and nine minutes of dynamic looping audio. And that's what this is. The dynamic looping audio, the best way to think about it is that it's three different audio beds sort of layered on top of each other. Um, and what you can do as a game master is adjust which of those beds are being kind of um, uh, presented more than others at once. And so that's what each of these are. So if I drag the slider up, this isolates one of those sound beds, which is more the percussion and the drums and things like that. Moving it over, it brings back some of those mid-tones more of the horns and, and some more of the gentler sounds that you hear. And then bringing it all the way down here to the bottom, this is like some of the ambient sounds that are part of the track, maybe some of the piano uh, noises and things like that. And so what this lets you do as the game master is play this sort of looping track over and over again um, to kind of keep the mood and keep the vibe. But maybe you have like an NPC that's revealing something very personal to them. You want to play the little softer music, but then they become like a turncoat villain um, in just a second, you can kind of slowly bring that audio up to the percussion over time to really sort of set that change in the narrative um, as like combat erupts or something like that. And so that sort of level and whatever, wherever all the sort of uh, uh, music is um, will be broadcasted to the players at whatever area the Game Master brings the slider to. So that's generally what Alchemy Enhanced music is, and a little bit more about Alchemy Enhanced in general. Finally, the last two things here. We have our universe search. Best thing, uh, what it does is uh, bring up uh, this sort of search bar for anyone who clicks on it, and they can search through any of the NPCs, the articles, any of the enabled content in the game. So for instance, for Dan and I's universe, we have a how to play article here. And if I go ahead and spell that right, you'll see that we have this little Start Playing Games uh, Fallout article from our universe, and I can do two things with it. First thing is I can view that article, right? So if I want to look at the contents Dan had typed up for me, this is a great way to sort of reference that information very quickly. 
or you know, maybe I'm a game master and I, I don't let my players use universe search, but I want to send them this one article as a reference to the rules. I can actually send that article to the journal so that now anyone can see that article. They can click on it. They can view the contents. And it's a great way for me to kind of manage uh, uh, getting them the rules that they need in a particular moment, but not giving them, you know, the keys to the castle if I don't necessarily want to do that for my table. So that sort of in a nutshell is what universe search is. You can filter it a little bit more as far as what you're looking for, but just understand that it allows you to look up content mid-game for anything that's enabled in the game itself. And then finally, the camera button right here shows video chat. So if you have video chat enabled in your game, you can go ahead and click it. It'll pop open the video drawer for any accounts that are currently active in the game. And if you have your video on, um, you can go ahead and uh, see it all right here. And then if you don't want it for any reason, right, you want to kind of put your friends away for a little bit, you can click the hide button um, and it'll just kind of move that drawer back. Very last thing, if I go ahead and play scene with a title and a location, that title and location will be visible uh, right here on the uh, top of, this, of the screen. And if you click it, if any credits are uh, associated with the assets as part of that scene, you'll actually be able to see them right here. And so that is kind of a full rundown of the um, uh, uh, Game Master's gameplay experience uh, here in Alchemy. And so it's a pretty big overview. Um, if you still have some questions, you can definitely look at our knowledge base um, to, to maybe fill in a couple of those gaps. Um, but from here, now that you have sort of a really good basis with Alchemy, um, I'm going to start turn it over to Dan, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about Fallout and uh, uh, how the integration on Alchemy works with that. So send it over to him. All right. So thank you, Vinny, for all of that. Uh, that was a very nice, comprehensive guide on how to use the platform and how to use it, of course, for Fallout. But I'm going to go ahead and step into how to actually play Fallout, the 2D20 Modifius game here on Alchemy. Now, I'm kind of nervous. It takes a second for me to get in, but I brought a friend with me to kind of help me out in this endeavor and give you guys a little bit of a up boost uh, since, you know, Vinny's been talking so long. So one second, let me go get him for, for a second. Zone, everyone. I'm glad you could join us today. You know, it's not often we get volunteers to go out into the waste, but here you are. You know, my. My, look how enthusiastic all of you are. Well, if you're going to go out into the waste that was once the beating heartbeat of America, you may as well be prepared. Well, let's go over everything you're going to need to know on how to play Fallout here on Alchemy. Right. That was a little weird, but I mean, you get the idea. We're going to go over how to play Alchemy here, or I'm, we're, we're going to learn how to play Fallout on Alchemy. And the first thing we need to talk about is kind of where this all begins, right? How does, I guess, how does the uh, tabletop game kind of compare to the video game? Because we all know the video game. We've, we've come to love it. We know that it takes place in post-apocalyptic uh, America and, and, and when, uh, you know, post bombs dropping and everything like that. But where does this take place? So if you know Fallout, this takes place in Fallout 4. So you're going to see uh, key locations like Vault 75, Boston Common, Lexington, Sanctuary. All of those will make a reappearance. You know, the events of this book, though, are meant to give that same feeling of the game. So when you jump into the game, you kind of are either being defrosted <laughs> or you are kind of coming into the world anew. Um, that's kind of giving you this. That's the, the the TTRPG is giving you kind of the same feeling. You're you're coming into this world anew um, and you're kind of building a life and world for yourself. Uh, what that means, though, is that basically uh, you'll be given a clean slate to start with. So you don't have to follow what Fallout 4 does in the video game. Now you can, you can, of course, but according to like the book and everything like that, they give you a billion different options to do completely outside of the game. So this is the quintessential sandbox game, meaning you could do whatever you want in this game. We'll go over exactly how intricate and how wildly uh, sandbox this game is. Now you're gonna meet ghouls, robots, super mutants, synths, the Brotherhood of Steel, raiders and wastelanders, just like before in the game, 
and also all of the mutated wildlife that you can imagine. But we're not here necessarily to talk about Fallout. You should pretty much already know what Fallout is. Um, but we are here to learn how to play it on Alchemy, and we're, we're going to learn a little bit more about the TTRPG itself. And the first thing we need to talk about when we talk about any TTRPG is how to create a character, because you can't play the core mechanics if you don't have a character. So let's go ahead and jump into character creation. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and uh, delete this character that I have so that way I can start a new. It's going to bump me out to the intro screen. Yep, I know. And then we're going to start up. Now, when your players join, this is the first thing they're going to see. They can either choose a character from their library that they've created out of game. They can choose a pre-made that either you, you as the GM have made for them, or if you want to use the alchemy pre-mades, you can use those as well. And I think the core, not the core rule, but the starter set even comes with pre-made. So they're all going to be there. There's going to be just a huge list of pre-made. So if you don't want to create a character from scratch, you can literally pick up the game and go and you're already playing the game. So we have pre-mades ready to go for you. But what we're going to talk about now is how to create a character from scratch. So come up to the top here, hit that little arrow and you'll see create player character. It'll say, hey, we're in alpha right now. We won't be in alpha for much longer at all. Um, but then you're going to come up to this screen right here. If you see da uh, down on the middle section of your screen, this little avatar, you can click that and that's going to open your character sheet. Now it's completely blank currently, as you can see, and our job is to fill it out. So if you go to the top left, you can hit this edit toggle and it's going to open up the character sheet in general. Now, of course, you can go ahead and name your character right off the bat if you want, or you can base it off of whatever you pick later. But I'm going to name myself Dan the Man. So no matter what, that's my name. Then you can see here, we're going to start off with Origin. In this game, Origin is kind of similar to your race and class in other games and such, uh, but it basically kind of tells who you are uh, and, and what you might look like and stuff like that. So um, there's a lot of different mechanics depending on who you choose here. You have the Brotherhood uh, Initiate, you have Ghouls, Super Mutants, Mr. Handy, Survivors, and Vault Dwellers. And depending on what you pick might change a few of your statistics as well. We're going to go with the easy one here, and we're just going to go with Vault Dweller. Picking Vault Dweller, I'm going to say I'm level 1, and when you're level 1, you start with an XP to next level at 100. Then we are going to move down to Special. Now, Special, just like the game, stands for Strength, Perception, uh, Endurance, Charisma, Intelligence, Agility, and Luck. If you are a fan of the game, you realize this is almost a one-to-one, -one, well, this is a one-to-one -one of what the game has. But what you can see here is each statistic will have five points in it. Now, normally you're going to start with five points to divvy out. So you can have any points here or you can add any points to any of these statistics when you start out. So five points, you just kind of put them wherever you want and you just click the little plus button to put it where you want or not. Or what you can do when you first start uh, or create a character, you can take one of those statistics or any of those statistics down to four to give yourself another point to spend. So for instance, if I wanna say, you know what, maybe I'm uh, not so fast, so I'm gonna take my agility down to four, that's gonna give me an extra point to spend. So instead of starting with five points to spend, now I have six and I can use those six wherever I want. Now, if you you get a little bit of uh, um, uh, not knowing where to put the points or anything like that, this game comes with a, a nice array that you can um, choose from. Uh, and there are three arrays that you can choose from essentially kind of like a um, a generalized one and then like a balanced one and so on so forth. But uh, I'm going to go the <laughs> the really easy way out and I'm just going to put one point in everything till I run out of them. Three, four, five. Boom. Simple. So that is how you divvy out your special points or your attributes, if you will. Moving down to skills. Now, skills here in this game are uh, essentially how you are going to determine your target number that you're going to be trying to reach with your uh, with your dice rolls. We'll go over dice rolls here in just a moment. But what you need to know whenever you're going into your skills is the first thing you do is you're going to choose three tag skills. Tag skills are essentially what is your character good at, right? I want to go in here and I'm going to choose three things that my character might be good at. You know, it might be stealth. Maybe they're good at talking to people so their speech is good and uh let's say 
you know what? They like to, they're, they're a little roguish. They, they, maybe they're good at lock picking too. So I have these three uh, tag skills that I've chosen. There's a lot more to that definition, but let's go ahead and move on from that. Let's keep going with how to create this character. So I've chosen my three tag skills and the, the moment I cho choose those three tag skills, I'm going to go over here and raise the number that is attached to that tag skill to two. You essentially get two free points in any of those tag skills. Then in order to divvy out any extra points that you may have, you're going to take the number nine and then add your intelligence to it. So my intelligence here is six and my uh, and I'm going to add nine to that. So my total number that I can spend here is 15. So now I can divvy out 15 points amongst all of these different uh, different things. And as you can see, I'm putting three because three is the maximum during character creation in any one of these skills. Uh, so um, just make sure that you're adding up correctly and making sure that you are putting in the correct amount of things, but also not going over your maximum. So uh, you can see that there are some of these that have zero and that will happen. Um, don't don't mind that. You can, of course, do the jack of all trades and just do ones down the line if you don't you're not comfortable with them all being zero. But I like, you know, being good at some things and not being good at others. So we'll keep it at that. Now, I'm not going to divvy out the exact number of points. You'll get the idea. But I will say that once that's done, you can move on to description. Now, this description area shows basically, you know, maybe what you look like. What do you smell like? How do you act? All the things that you might think you want to keep track of on your character. And then right below that, you will see a toggle uh, called public description. This public description toggle essentially allows anybody that clicks on your avatar to see anything that you've put into this public description area. Now, if you don't click that, then they don't see anything except for your avatar. Now, if you click that, they'll see your avatar and this description, but it'll keep all your statistics and maybe any secrets that you want kept within all your skills or items, you know, on your sheet. Uh, last but not least on this page is the tactical section. Now, the tactical section here is uh, based for uh, if you want to use maps in your game. Uh, Fallout is a very kind of obscure combat system. Um, it's not a, a it's not based on like uh, direction or or like, you know, five feet versus 10 feet kind of range or anything like that. It's based on zones. Uh, so it's very theater of the mind based. It's very in the moment. Ask your GM what you believe your range might be, that kind of stuff. And so tokens don't necessarily matter in terms of size. Um, you know, if you want to have a character or a creature that's more imposing, of course, you can make it bigger so that it looks cooler on a map. But other than that, I like to keep that at one by one. So that way everybody's is the same. Next up, we go to the top and that is the perks tab. Now, the perks tab has traits and perks. And the trait is directly connected to your uh, to your character. So your origin here. Now, my origin is Vault Dweller, right? And if I go over to my perks and drop down, you'll see a bunch of options. Now, for all of them, except for Survivor, you have one option. So just go ahead and select that one option. Now, if you choose Survivor, you have several options here to help kind of customize that character just a little bit more. You'll also see that Survivors get a chance to take two traits uh, or trait and additional uh, um, perk. So they, they get really customized, customizable. But we're going to go ahead and select Vault Kid and we're going to read what it says. Now, I can get better endurance tests uh, against disease and everything like that. But also you can read here that I have now an, an additional tag skill to choose. So now that I see that I've chosen my Vault Kid and I have an additional uh, tag skill, I'm going to go down here and say, OK, well, I got an additional tag skill. You know what? Maybe I want to be good at energy weapons. So I'm going to click that. And don't forget that any tag skill you pick goes straight to two. So now I've got all my stats good to go there. Next up is I'm going to pick my one perk. Now, as a vault dweller, I only get the one perk. Survivor, you can choose and possibly have two. But you start out with one normally. And there's about a billion perks. There's 94, I believe, um, to start off with. But what that means, though, is that a lot of these are going to be uh, kind of attached to a requirement that uh, is necessary in order to take that. Now, we'll just say that I have this requirement, but make sure that before you take this perk and just continue on with your character, that you actually meet that requirement before taking it. Um, and that's the last thing we're going to go ahead and do on this page. We're going to move on to combat. Now, your maximum HP is calculated by using your endurance plus your luck. 
So you can go back to your first page and you can just do some calculations. You do your endurance plus your luck. And for me, that is going to equal 11. So I'm just going to put 11 in there. Your defense in this game is calculated with your agility. If your agility is below eight, your, uh, your defense is one. If your agility is above eight, your defense is two. Now, I don't have a good agility, so I'm just going to go ahead and put it at one. What defense means is essentially that is how difficult it is to hit you. These are considered the number value for successes. So basically, if uh, the enemy gets one success against you and you have a defense of one, they succeed and they actually will hit you. The better your defense, obviously, the less chance you are to be hit. Then you have your melee damage bonus. And if your character is extremely strong and their strength is high, then they can start raising the amount of damage they do with melee weapons. My character, not so much. So that is the sixth, and that means that my melee damage bonus is zero. But that's okay, we can move on from there. The initiative is just your perception plus your agility. So for me, that's also 11. And then here you'll see a bunch of DRs or damage reductions. So basically what this area is in this game, you'll find that armor pieces are based on body parts. Unlike other games where you kind of just equip an armor and now you're that's 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 your bonus to maybe your armor class or whatever it might be in this you will have separate pieces of armor for separate pieces of your body. You could have maybe a metal arm uh, arm piece and uh, a, a leather helmet and maybe a power armor leg, whatever it might be. And you can go ahead and make the corrections here um, at, according to whatever the armor gives you. There'll be more information on the armor once you equip it. Um, but once you go ahead and make these changes, you can, of course, move on to the next page. We'll come back here if we equip some armor and make those changes accordingly. Then you have the conditions tab and the conditions tab is filled with all the things that you need to survive here in Fallout. Uh, the underlying uh, kind of theme of Fallout is a survival game. So here in the game, they have put as many things as they can to kind of give you that feeling. So you have hunger, thirst, sleep, exposure and disease. So all these different things will come into play during gameplay. Let's say you haven't eaten in a while. Well, your your uh, hunger might be going down as you don't eat. And so every time you don't eat, it gives you a description of when you're going to move down on this tier again and if there's any repercussions. So if, for instance, as I go down on this thing, it's going to tell me to start taking levels of fatigue. So if I need to take a level of fatigue, I can track it here. Now, you also have a tracker on your main screen, but here is a nice way to keep track of it as well. And all of these are the same way. So if you keep tagging on these, it will tell you to, you start need uh, you need to start taking levels of fatigue. And as you level or as, as you take more fatigue, the game gets more and more difficult, as you can expect. And then lastly on this page is diseases. So if you ever catch a disease of any sort, you can just click on any one of them, and it'll tell you what that disease is and possibly how to get rid of it. Then we have the equipment tab. You have your caps up top, which are your how you spend money in this game. That is your currency. And then we have your current carry weight and your max carry weight. Now, your max carry weight is calculated by 150 plus your strength times 10. It sounds wild, but basically strength times 10 here. So I have a six, so it's 60. And then 150 plus that makes it 210. That's my max carry weight. Um, your items that you have all have a uh, item weight attached to it so you can see how much it, it has and then of course you can come here and adjust accordingly just to make sure that you're not going over your uh your item weight um then of course uh salvage materials in this game uh, we have a crafting system essentially so everything that you salvage or you, uh, you basically pick up after or through an area you can salvage things and when you do you'll be given these uh salvage materials whether it be common uncommon, rare, whatever, and you can kind of keep track of what you have uh, in your character sheet. Then we have the equipment. Now, the equipment in this game, it's uh, it's a little different. It kind of uh, dictates your subclass or your subcategory of who you are in general, like maybe where you came from, maybe a background, that kind of thing. So as you can see, um, there are a lot of options for these different uh, the different origins that you've uh, seen before. 
And as a vault dweller, I can choose to either be maybe a resident of a vault or maybe I was security in the vault. I'm going to go ahead and choose resident uh, and it's going to give me a lot of options. Um, now, not necessarily options. It's going to tell you basically what you need to equip on this character, right? So the first thing I want to see is or I want to do is if I see something at the end that says caps, I can go ahead and go to the top here and just fill out my caps, right? I start with 10 caps. I want to make sure that I have my money. Mm hmm. And then then uh, I'm going to start equipping things so I can see now that I have this vault jumpsuit. I have a gun, all kinds of stuff. Once you kind of get an idea of what you have here, you can go here to your gear icon and click add item. So I'm going to add my vault jumpsuit to my inventory. You click add item and I'm just going to type in vault. And oh, I'm going to type in vault. There we go. And I'm going to click add and by clicking add, it's going to go ahead and add that vault jumpsuit to my inventory, as you can see right here. Now I'm going to add a weapon so that way I can use that weapon here uh, later on. So I'm going to get my 10 millimeter pistol 10 millimeter and some ammo, right? Because in this game, you're going to be tracking your ammo constantly because if you shoot, you're using ammo. It's a survival game, right? Um, I'm also going to add a, a, a switchblade because that comes with something special that we're going to talk about later. So give me that switchblade and click my my little uh, accept button at the bottom. And now I have everything that I need in my inventory. Now, of course, I can go through and fill out whatever I'm missing if I need to for my starting equipment and all that good stuff. Now, if I'm wearing armor, for instance, this vault jumpsuit gives me some uh, when I click into it, I'll see its description and it tells me what uh, type of um, armor uh, reductions or damage reductions it gives me. So you can see here it gives me energy damage reduction, radiation damage reduction, and it tells me that this jumpsuit actually covers my arms, legs and torso. So that means that both my arms, both my legs and my torso are going to be covered by this one piece of armor. Now you can start piecing together different pieces of armor as you go through, but this one specifically covers them all. Now, if I wanted to, I can, of course, go and start filling out my damage reductions. As you can see, all these things have one energy to radiation. So I can say, OK, I can go to my combat and just start filling these out accordingly. I'm not going to go ahead and do that because I don't need to uh, explain that further. Um, then lastly, of course, if your character starts with a trinket in this game, you can, of course, go down, uh, go and hit the drop down and you can choose from the list of trinkets or you can, of course, come up with your own. Um, you could also hit this randomize button if you don't want to think about it too hard. You can just hit that randomize button and it'll give you a trinket for you. Now, a trinket in this game essentially means that during uh, when you're outside of combat, you can use your trinket uh, once per adventure or once per mission or whatever you want to call it, once per quest, um, and you can regain a luck point. We're going to go over what luck is in a bit. Lastly is the trackers area. So my character, uh, you can see, has a maximum HP of 11 um, and they have a luck skill and everything like that. So luck for me actually is five. So I'm not going to change that. But if I would say uh, start with a higher luck skill or, or whatever it might be, I would raise this up or lower it accordingly. Then my HP, I know that my HP is 11. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to change that to 11. So that way, I look up here, my max HP shows 11 and I'm good to go. Once all that is done, all I need to do now is click my little uh, check mark at the bottom to make sure that it saves instead of that X. You don't want to hit this X up top because that'll exit out of everything without saving. So I'm going to hit this little check mark. Boom, we're done. We have our character and they're good to go. Now, huh? <sighs> Hold on, he wants to say something again. Like an infant learning to walk, you've now taken your first steps into surviving the wastelands. Oh, but what's this? You're not sure what to do now? Well, Daniel, why don't you help our friends out here? Thanks. Take it away. Daniel? I'm a big fan of that, I guess. But uh, you understand what we're doing here. You're going to learn how to play the game now. You have your character, but now what? How do you play the game? Well, Fallout is a 2D20 system by Modifius, and it's a roll under system. So essentially, 
you're looking to roll under a target value instead of roll over in that, like a lot of games. So in this game, a natural 20, not so good. Natural one is what you're looking for. Those are your crit values, right? So in this game, we're gonna be talking about like how to make a roll. So the first thing you need to know is that making rolls in this game are pretty simple. They're always gonna start off with a 2d20 roll. So you have your skills and everything like that, and we'll go over what that means in a second. But to make a roll, all you need to simply do is click this little vault boy at the bottom, and you're gonna see a dice tray pop up. The first one is your basic roll. You just click that and you click OK. Look at that. We got our basic roll. Now, what does this number mean? What does a 9 and a 10 mean? Well, here's how rolling in this game works. Your GM is essentially going to tell you how to make the roll, right? It's going to say, you know what? You are trying to do something specific. Maybe you are trying to sneak into this location um, and uh, uh, you need to roll a, a sneak and agility check in order to to, um, in order to pass this roll. Uh, well, you're gonna go ahead and check out your sneak and agility. Um, and my agility is a five and my sneak is a three. So my target score here is actually an eight. So I'm going to be looking to roll under an eight in order to get this to be a successful roll. So whenever I say, okay, I know that I need to make a sneak check. Cool, I'm gonna be rolling and trying to get under an eight. So I'm gonna roll my basic roll and I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna roll. Can I get an under an eight? Hey, we got one eight. So that means we succeed because we rolled at or under the number that we needed. So I rolled an eight, that gave me one success. It, if it was an easy challenge, it means that there's probably only need, you only need one success in order to succeed at this thing, actually to succeed at it. Um, but if the GM says, you know what, this was a little bit more difficult and says, actually you need two successes or maybe you need three or four or five successes in order to succeed at this extremely hard thing, you need to make sure that you're taking the, the right moves in order to try and get those six, that number of successes. So if you need a decent amount of successes, you can go here and you can use what's called action points. And action points in this game are very important and things that you're gonna be using all the time in order to do certain things or make certain uh, moves in this game. So usually if you see something that says it takes this amount of AP or whatever while you're reading through the book, you will kind of understand now that you can use your action points in different ways. The main way and the most common way is probably going to ever be used is to add dice to your pool. Now, as we had shown before, your game trackers is global. That means that the action point pool for players is shared. So if there are six points in the pool and you're saying, hey, I want to use one of these points to add an extra dice to the pool, you're going to be taking away from others. So make sure that you communicate with your team when you say, hey, I'm going to use an action point in order to get an extra dice on this roll so that way we can maybe succeed. Because maybe they're like, oh, wait, no, wait, let's let's wait till the next one and, and a more important roll comes up, then we want to use it. Now, you can always regain your action points by using an action essentially called rally that will then basically regenerate your action points. Um, but it does take an action in combat. And of course, out of combat, you can just regenerate your action points accordingly. So I'm going to use my action point in order to give myself another dice. Well, how or another die? How do I do that? Well, I just mark that I've used my action point. I click that basic roll to make sure that I have the 2d20 that I need. And then I'm going to click the action point die right next to it. Every action point die I add, I could just keep clicking to it or right click to take away if I need to. So I know I've got my basic roll and my my bonus die that I've added and I can now click OK. I can see the action point dice that I've used and I can see the basic roll. And now with all three, I have succeeded twice in this roll as I needed to roll eight or under. Now, the GM will tell you what happens if you succeed or if you fail or whatnot, but you will then, of course, act accordingly. The uh, the one thing that you need to know is that when rolling dice, you can get a natural 20 or you get a natural one. And those are your criticals. If you roll a natural 20 in this game, which is a no bueno, you don't want to do that kind of thing. Let's see what it looks like. So if you roll a natural 20 on these dice right here, you are looking at a complication. Something is going to go wrong. Now, whether or not you're shooting a weapon or maybe you're punching somebody or maybe you're holding a grenade, 
whatever happens, there's a mishap table and you will essentially kind of go through and see which mishap actually happens. Um, now, that's basically what happens when you roll a 20. Now, what happens when you roll a one? As you can see, this little, this cool little symbol here actually denotes a one on the 20 for the Fallout uh, game. The one means that it's a critical success. And all that means is that instead of it counting as one success, it counts as two towards succeeding at whatever uh, the difficult value um, that the GM has set. So now I've rolled a lot of dice, but you know, it, we really just need to talk about the critical. So one is the normal critical and will always be a critical, meaning that you can always get two successes if you roll a one. But what happens if I roll one of these skills, the ones that I've put a tag onto, right? These little buttons uh, count as tags. And what happens if I rolled a stealth versus a something that isn't a tag, right? If I roll stealth and that is a tag skill, that critical range goes from being a one to go over to the right. That value, whatever you have attached to that skill. So now instead of critting, <clears throat> excuse me, now instead of critting at only one, I crit at three, two, and one. And so any value I get at three, two, or one will count as two successes. So needless to say, the skills that you're tagged in, the more likely you are to be really good at those things because you're like more likely to get those critical successes. So make sure when you're choosing your tag skills that you choose something that you're good at. <clears throat> now here you can see that we have a little, uh, a little marker next to the actual ability that it's connected to. These are the general abilities that they're connected to. Like they're always, they're normally those, but there's a functionality in this game called luck. If you use luck during this game, you can use it in several ways. One is basically literally just getting lucky, right? I can use a luck point during a scene and I get lucky somehow. If we're looking for a key or something, I could find the key. I say, hey, I wanna use my luck because uh, we still haven't found that key after 30 minutes of looking. Then, oh, look, <laughs> it was under my foot the whole time. So you can get lucky if you use a luck point. Another way you can use luck is by going over here and you can see these abilities attached to skills. Well, let's say I'm not really good at a particular skill. Maybe my um, uh, maybe my intelligence isn't so good, but my luck skill is what I really base my character on. Maybe my luck is eight and my uh, my science is four, right? Something like that, or not my science, but my intelligence is four. Well, I can use a luck point and I can swap that intelligence out to luck. And now that si that science and luck will be the role versus the uh, intelligence in science. And that it raises the amount uh, that you're looking for for your, your role value or your role uh, target, um, your target number. Uh, and then that basically makes it more of a chance to succeed on things. You can use your other, you can use your luck in, in many different ways, but those are kind of like the main ways. Of course, there are different ways you can look up in the book, but uh, yeah, those are like the two main directive ways. Um, another way you can use things like action points um, are going to be, let me go down to my action points tab. So action points in this game, uh, are used in several ways. One of the ways is, of course, adding dice the way we talked about uh, initially, um, where you can add dice to the pool by buying D20s. But another way you can use an action point is obtaining information. Maybe you are out and about and you want to ask your game master a single question. Your game master is going to answer you truthfully. You know, mind you, it might not be as direct of an answer as you may want or need, but by using a point, uh, an action point during that scene, they might give you some information that you need to kind of move the scene on. You also can do what is called reducing time. Let's say, for instance, you're trying to hack into a computer um, and there are some ghouls banging on the door and they're about to break in. The GM tells you, hey, hacking into that computer is going to take about 10 minutes. Well, you can use two action points to have the amount of time that it takes to do something. So for instance, instead of it taking 10 minutes, I'm going to use two action points. And now it's five minutes until, you know, whatever, until I hack the computer. And hopefully my friends are there to help me along the way. 
Um, there are other things like making um, making your moves go faster in combat and stuff uh, like that, but action points are mainly used for things like that. And of course, the reducing time thing takes effect really well on like longer term things. So for instance, if something takes six hours to do, I can use two action points and reduce it only to three. So things like that are really useful. Um, let's see here. All right. Next up, uh, we have uh, combat, essentially, right? How does combat work? Well, in combat, you're going to have items, you're going to have weapons and everything like that. And you kind of need to know how to use them. Well, if you look on the screen here, you can see that we have an equipment tab. The things that we equip, uh, that we put into our equipment tab, basically into our backpack um, before we jump into our scene. Well, here on the right of each uh, one of these, you'll either see a circle or you won't. If you see a circle, go ahead and equip that item. And by doing so, it's going to activate some actions for you here on the left side. Now, these are damage rolls. And the reason these are damage rolls are because the fact that you need to change things on the fly. And if you need to say, hey, you know what, instead of uh, my, uh, you know, strength plus uh, my melee weapons. Now I want to roll luck plus my melee weapons. So what you need to do is go here back to the front and you need to make sure that you are rolling according to whatever stats you are, you have. And again, those are literally just your basic rolls plus however many action point dice you want to add to that. So you make those rolls and you try to hit. Now in combat, you're trying to beat the enemy's defense rating, their DR or their armor, whatever their armor is. So if their armor is one or their DR is one, you only need one success in order to hit them. Now, if it was two or three, then you would need two or three successes in order to hit them. So let's say, for instance, I go to use my 10 millimeter pistol and I want to hit somebody. Well, in order to roll a 10 millimeter pistol roll in this game, you need to make a ranged weapon attack, which is an agility plus whatever type of weapon you have. So I have a small this is a small consider a small gun. So I use my small gun ability. So it's my agility plus small guns. I'll make that whatever that might be, you know, maybe a six or something like that. I, I didn't really raise my small guns that very, uh, very well. So I actually have a very difficult time hitting with it, but we'll see. Let's see what we get. So I'm just going to roll a basic roll and we'll see what we get. Now we're looking for, hey, oh no. <laughs> okay. This is the situation where something goes wrong, but also something goes right. So I do hit, but there's a complication. Uh, so I did roll under my target number, but also uh, there I rolled a natural 20, which means a complication happens for my gun. That's neither here nor there. We're not going to talk about complications. We already talked about what that means, but we're going to talk about what happens if you do hit, right? So if you go and you, uh, you do hit, all you need to do is click your weapons damage button. We have an action for that. We have every uh, weapons in this game's um, damage already suited out for you. So you only need to click into it and you can either click on it and go to the middle and click use, or you can just right click on it and click use. When you do, you're going to roll that weapons damage. And weirdly enough, we got uh, a lot of vault boys on this one. So as you can see, that's not numbers. What does that mean? <laughs> right? So in the fallout, they have their custom damage dice. So here I'm going to roll a bunch of them to see uh, if I can get a bunch of their faces here. Okay. And you can see that there's different faces to see. We have a one hit, a two hit, a blank and a vault boy. So the hits are pretty simple. That just means one damage, two damage, no damage. Sometimes you can hit and not do any damage if you're unlucky. And then a Vault Boy head is one damage plus a damage effect. Well, what's a damage effect? Well, as you can see, when I rolled this, it doesn't say damage effect anywhere. Well, some weapons don't have damage effects. But let's go down to this switchblade, for instance. I'm going to click my switchblade. And look at here. I didn't roll any, <laughs> any damage. But let's say I rolled a Vault Boy on one of these. Well, I'm going to do one damage plus the damage effect. And look here, this damage effect is piercing one. Piercing one in this game, if you go, oh, if you're if you're confused or ever confused about what the damage effect is or anything like that, go to your weapons, go to your equipment and go to your weapon and just view it. And you can see all the stuff that's attached to it and all the upgrades you might be able to make to it. But here you can see piercing essentially means that you can ignore some of the armor or uh, basically go through the armor of the target. 
for a, the amount of piercing. So if it's like piercing one, two, three, that's how much armor you can pierce through if you hit uh, with a fall or uh, a um, uh, a vault boy. So now that I know I have that vault boy, I can pierce through that armor and not even have to worry about it and just do the damage. So that is how kind of rolling in combat works. You roll, you roll your 2d20 to try to get the number of successes in order to get the thing that you want to happen happen. And then you roll the damage according to whatever weapon you have equipped. Now, there are some huge weapons in this game. And if you are a fan of Fallout, then you know about what I'm about to do. The biggest weapon, the most wild weapon in the game. Yes, that is correct. The Fat Man that shoots miniature nukes at people. So they do have that in this game. And you really can make a roll to hit, but you're probably going to hit anyways because there's a blast radius attached to it, right? And all that is explained in the weapon if you go to check it out in your equipment. But you know what? Just for fun, what does it look like when you roll a fat man damage? Well, let's go ahead and do that. Oh my goodness. Oh gosh, that's a lot of damage. <laughs> so as you can see, this is like area of effect. This is like a bunch of damage to calculate. And yes, they do stack. So you start counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So basically you go through and you count like that. And of course, you can see all the damage effects that are tied to that weapon when you hit with it. So there are all kinds of stuff you can do with weapons and, and ammo and, and all that good stuff. And of course, when you shoot something, you want to make sure you're tracking your ammo. You can see that the ammo is a, uh, has a, uh, a number attached to it. You can either go in, edit it, uh, or you can even create your own tracker, um, you know, according to whatever ammunition you have. Um, speaking of trackers, you see on the right side that there is a fatigue tracker that you can obviously uh, go and put points into to see how many levels of fatigue you have. And if you want to, you know, adjust it so we can see it, it shows you how many levels of fatigue. Then your trinket, like I said, you can use once per session. We just have a little button that you can click to kind of annotate whether or not you've used it. Here, you'll see power armor HP. Well, what does that mean? Well, in this game, power armor has its own HP pool. So if you roll to hit and you hit the, it uh, uh, and the GM hits your power armor, well, your HP and the power armor will go away before your actual HP does. Um, so, you know, you can t keep track of that or you can just kind of get rid of these if you don't need them or if you don't have power armor to clear up your tracker space. Um, that way you can see everything that you need to see up to you. Now, of course, if you've been given handouts, you're going to see that the handouts button is right there. I threw that. I threw it off the screen, but uh, you can see here um, that you can just adjust it and move it around just like uh, was shown in Vinny's display. Uh, one of the, the last things I want to talk about here is combat and how it's kind of uh, like I said, it's kind of theater, the mind based and zone based is how they call it zones. I'd like to picture it basically as if you are in a building, um, you basically have rooms in the building, maybe you have a hallway and maybe you have a staircase and stuff like that. Each one of those things is considered a zone. So you have different zones basically within this area. Each weapon has a uh, a preferred zone. So like uh, melee weapons, obviously you want to be in the same zone as the enemy you're attacking. But when you're in the same zone, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're like right next to your enemy, right? You could be within the same zone and not be within reach of them. So make sure that you're communicating with your GM and saying, you know, I want to be in the same zone, but I also don't want to be within reach of them. Or, you know, maybe I want to be in reach with them. So you just got to communicate with them and let them know. And then there are the zones beyond that. Well, ranged weapons have a preferred range, right? Those number of zones up until you are there. So let's say, for instance, you're shooting a rifle and it has a range of two. That means that the preferred range will be two zones away. If you are closer or further away from those two zones away, you're going to start making your difficulty value go up. So instead of maybe you only need one success to hit this thing, if you're closer or further away, now it's two successes in order to hit this thing. So it just kind of ups the difficulty and ramps up the difficulty according to whatever weapon you may be using. So zones works that way. Weapons works that way. What's the one thing that happens in a lot of games, especially survival? Well, it's death, right? Things that happen can happen real quick. <laughs> and especially in this game, death is always on your heels. So talking about death in this game, um, it is very easy 
to die. Um, but what happens when you basically go down to zero? What's, uh, what happens like in other games, you might have to roll a few successes or whatever. In this game, it's a bit different. Now, when you go down to zero, the first thing that happens is whatever limb or whatever, yeah, whatever limb or part of your body that gets hit, it suffers an injury. And each limb that you get hit in has a different like injury attached to it. So if you take a hit in the arm, maybe you lose, you know, lose the ability to use your arm. Or if you get hit with your leg, now your movement suffers and you can't use your leg, whatever. But either way, whenever you go down to zero HP, you immediately go unconscious. You drop to the ground. You can't recover HP from the first aid action and you can't take any actions. You're done. You're on the ground. So what happens there? Well, when it becomes your turn again, or it comes up to your turn to begin with, you must make an endurance plus survival test. Your endurance and your survival are attached to your attribute and your skills, obviously. And when you make that test, the success value in order to succeed is tied to your injuries. So if you go down, you take an injury, right? If you go down to zero, you take an injury. So that is one. So you need one success in order to not die. But if you go down to a critical hit, let's say, for instance, there was a critical hit on one of your, your limbs or whatever it might be, that means that you take two injuries immediately. And if you take two injuries, that means the difficult value has now gone up to two in order to survive. Well, you get one chance right away to make that roll. And if you don't make that success value on your death save, that's it. You did. <laughs> so if you go unconscious, make sure your teammates are there. Make sure you're healing. Make sure you're doing everything you possibly can do to try and avoid having to make that roll, right? You want to be able to get up as soon as you possibly can. So make sure you got friends ready to go. Make sure you got, if somebody else is down, make sure you prioritize them. Uh, otherwise your friends can go down in one hit. So, uh, the one other thing is, is maybe, if, maybe your GM has something out for you and you start, he starts hitting you while you're down, you know, that can happen in other games too. In this game, when they hit you, when you're down and you're unconscious, that just adds to your injury table. So you basically take another injury and it makes it harder and harder to basically come back up from being dead. Now, what happens if you do succeed on that? Well, you get one success. That doesn't mean you're actually back up. That just means you don't die. What has to happen in order for you to actually get back up is your team has to heal you. So your partners or whoever you're with has to either hit you with a stim pack, first aid, whatever it might be to get you back up and moving. So um, you're just going to keep making those rolls over and over again until they do so. Uh, the one thing is, is if you are a Mr. Handy robot, you got to make sure that you are stocked up on like repair kits or maybe you have somebody in your uh, on your team that's a good mechanic because you can't heal from a stim pack as Mr. Handy. You actually have to take repairs uh, as a robot would uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, that is kind of the uh, the 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 short and long of, of combat. The, the one thing that you need to know, I guess, uh, other than what I've told you is in combat, your turn uh, is essentially just two things. It is a, uh, a large action and a minor action. Uh, so major action, minor action. Major action is like attacking with a weapon. A minor action might be pulling something out, maybe drinking something, maybe injecting something or moving. Your movement is also a minor action. Uh, and that would just be moving from zone to zone. All that stuff uh, just goes into a major action and minor action per round. And you take your rounds as normal. Initiative in this game is really super duper duper easy. It's literally just your initiative number. There is no rolling for initiative. So basically, whenever you go into combat, you all get shifted right where you always will be in combat. And the only differing factor is the NPC that you're fighting. So your NPC might kind of shove themselves in between you and one of your friends that have always kind of been right between each other, that kind of thing. Um, so if my, you know, if my initiative was 11, right, my initiative is 11 and I have a friend who's 13, my friend who's 13 is always going to go first and then I'm always going to go underneath them. Unless I, of course, change my stats in any way, or an NPC kind of jumps in the middle, middle with like an initiative of 12. That's basically how initiative works. It's super easy and, and kind of makes the combat go like that. So um, that's pretty much it. So <laughs> this has been an absolute race through the rulebook. You have to remember, if you're watching this, you have to remember that this rulebook is 430 pages, I think. 430, over 400 pages long. 
And this is a massive endeavor if you are trying to learn every single little thing. Just remember, there's a lot of crafting. There's a lot of module, uh, you know, modularity to your weapons and stuff like that. There are settlements, there are NPCs. So you have to remember that going back to the book isn't a bad thing. You don't have to remember everything. And what I told you today, what I've taught you today is essentially you can take everything that I that I showed you today and jump in and play a game and just learn as you go, because there's a lot of things that take looking up. A lot of things happen every once in a while, not very often. It might be an obscure ruling, whatever it is, go into the book, learn some for yourself, but take what I've taken, uh, given you today and go out and start playing. You can start playing immediately. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Vinny, I want to uh, thank you for, for showing them the platform and everything. Um, and if you haven't already, go check out Fallout on uh, alchemyrpg.com. And um, that's pretty much it. I, I just wanted to say thank <sighs> Really? One second, guys. I, he... Uh, He's being a nuisance again. No, I know. I know. Hold on. Just fine. Well, thank you all for joining us here, folks. Uh, hopefully, now you'll get everything you need to survive more than five minutes in the wastelands. Now, don't forget to like and subscribe to on our YouTube to be notified when these fine fellows post a video again. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and to lose.